Hey, what's up, Mo? Hello. <laughs> That's so perfect for Friday. <laughs> I, I figured I really need to start thinking more classroom. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that background just gives me like the most anxiety ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you. All the traumas from past. Yeah, all my mathematical traumas. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, guys? How's it Not going? Much. How you doing? I'm all right. Um, today should be really cool. Sydney is like super awesome, so I'm excited to talk to her. Uh, and also, it's Friday, so that's nice. Yeah, today is actually Friday now. Yes. It is actually Friday. <laughs> um, so yeah, you guys just hang out, hang tight while we wait for everybody. You know the drill. How you doing, Tony? Haven't seen you in a while. Oh, doing all right. Doing the best I can. How are you doing? Awesome. Doing great. Glad to get back to it. Oh, you have no idea, man. <laughs> so ready for classes. Yeah, I'm going to be heading back out to L.A. next week. Hopefully get started somewhere. Nice. That will be awesome. Me. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Pretty good. What about you? Oh, you know, just <laughs> watching my hometown burn to the ground. Is, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Man. It's been a long night. Yeah. That sucks. Do you have family there still? I do. Oh, how are they doing? Um, they're fine. Um, uh, the, sorry, give me two seconds because no, I have to sanitize okay. my hands. That's not a bad view. <clears throat> I know. Welcome to my home studio. <laughs> <laughs> LOL, JK. <laughs> oh, that looks familiar. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my family is okay. Um, my grandma lives in St. Paul, and um, my uncle, her son, lives with her. And um, they were hearing, like, a lot of shit all night they were hearing like uh those flash bombs throughout the night but uh luckily they didn't have to experience a lot of the um like uh gunfire and whatnot because most of that was happening in minneapolis and they're in saint paul mm -hmm. so still really scary um, yeah so but uh, here we are yes <laughs> um yeah, the news is really upsetting, like every day. It is. Yeah, it's really upsetting. Um, most of what I was watching last night was actually uh, li like uh, people in the community live streaming on the streets. Um, That's wild. Yeah, yeah did you really see CNN reporters and the camera crew and all them got arrested on, yeah. on camera, on TV? Yep. Yeah, the, the reporter's name was Omar. Yeah, he was... Yeah. He, him and his whole crew got arrested. Apparently, there was another crew on the ground in that area, um, but they had a white reporter, and they did not get arrested. So that's interesting, to say the least. They did <sighs> arrest the cop, though, today. Oh, yeah. The, the, the one guy, mm. the one cop. You hear that? hear that? He used to work with him? I've heard... I've heard that too, but like, it hasn't uh, been researched or confirmed. Confirmed, yeah. Yeah. That would be an interesting twist. It would be an interesting twist. Either way, it's all very, very horrible, and I'm glad that guy got arrested. Me too. And convicted. It looks like he got convicted already. Yeah, he got convicted. That. Okay, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Great. Well, so I'm just gonna um, give everyone just a few few more minutes before we get started, Sydney. Yeah, so. for sure. 
Um, although I'm trying to rack my brain what room you're in. This is Studio 5. That's the one with the SS. Okay, yeah. yeah. There it is. That's the SSO. Mm -hmm. Tasty. I had a choice between Studio 5 and Studio 2 today. Oh. And, uh, there's no reason for my decision other than the fact that I'm close to the bathroom here. <laughs> That's a pretty good reason. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. So. Oh, man. I'm just going to uh, send David Davis a text here because he wanted to. Is he going to come hang out? Yeah, he wanted to come. It's only right. I mean, he, I mean, you were able to come hang out and bug him during his. So. Yeah, I think it's a camaraderie thing. Yeah. Let's see. Today is our first day back on campus. Wow. Yeah, it's orientation. Every, everyone's at orientation. I don't know. I'll I'll hear from the team later. So I don't know, I don't is, know if you knew I, that I work remotely. I'm not in Arizona anymore. I did. Yeah, I did know that. Aren't you in Washington? Oregon. Oregon. That's yeah. right. I Washington. love Oregon. Yeah, Great it's place. gorgeous. That's funny that you said Washington. Why? <laughs> Uh, I lived in Oregon for two years, and yeah. eight, 10 years after I moved from there, I had family asking me, are you still in Washington? <laughs> That's funny. People get I, Washington and Oregon confused. Yeah. Oh, I, don't, I don't intentionally, you know, think of them as the same place. I just, for some reason, thought you were in Washington. Yeah, close enough. I was in Washington <laughs> yesterday. Oh, because where where I'm at, I can just like hop over there really quickly. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Pump your What's own. up, Matt? I made it. Hi. Yeah, you made Hi, it. Hi, Hi, Sydney. How's it going? <laughs> oh, it's good. It's been kind of a hectic afternoon, but other than that, yeah. How's yeah. the orientation going? It was interesting. Uh, everybody's like all spaced out, wearing masks and. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll be good though. Everybody seemed pretty cool. excited. Yeah. Sweet. How yeah, you doing? I hope, I hope no one deals with anything on campus like someone refusing to wear their mask. That will just uh, We haven't had that problem yet. Good. Um people have showed up without them. Um, but we have happily provided masks to those who show up without them. So yeah we'll see how it goes i'm sure there's bound to be you know some people that have their own opinions about what needs to happen and how things should be done so are you in studio five or is that virtual studio five this is for real <laughs> <laughs> this they is real life virtual backgrounds oh my god <laughs> i don't have a good enough green screen to achieve this sort of virtual background. No one's as good as Mo. <laughs> Where's Mo? Oh yeah, Mo, that's great. Can you, uh, do you know how to work through all of those equations behind you? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a poser is what you're saying. <laughs> Just kidding. No, kidding. Yeah. Maybe Mo aspires to, uh, yeah. to know all of that. I wish that I knew all of that. Math I, is not my forte. I have, it used to be mine, but I had a terrible math teacher who ruined it for me. <laughs> yeah, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, it does. Totally. Math teachers are like piano teachers. Sometimes they make you cry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially when they're <laughs> not helpful. Did you have a piano teacher make you cry? Absolutely. Nobody Aww. else did? No. Uh, Never. Just like... I don't know. Oh, of course. I definitely had several piano teachers that made me cry. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Is it like no, their job? They like they have cry. to make you cry? No. no. You're just little and like, you know, they're like the <laughs> old ladies that are like very... <laughs> they were the yeah, nicest, sweetest hand. people I've ever yeah, been wrist around. Down. Wrist down. <laughs> I had a... Um, my piano teacher was like this super Jewish woman with like, like red ish curly hair and she was really nice but her voice was very like firm and uh uh abrasive and so i know what you mean but she never like 
She never pushed me to the point of crying, I guess. Maybe that's why I don't play piano anymore. Because <laughs> she didn't whip me into shape. My mom made me cry more than my piano teacher did because she kept forcing me to play and she would be like right on top of me and yeah. hated it. No one wants their mom to teach them how to play music. That's no one. Terrible. No. No. <laughs> I had my, my grandma taught me, so it was fine. because She was rad. Hi, uh, David Davis. I see David and uh, some image. Oh, right that's there. what that is. That's David. <laughs> Show your face, David. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Is your hair messed up? Uh, yeah. No, I don't know. Let's see. I don't know how. How dare you, phone. Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my phone, so I don't know how. I'm trying uh, to figure it out. It should have a video start video option. Yeah. It's up in the without your face. Top right corner. I think he's messing with you guys. I'm pretty sure David knows how to turn on the video. <laughs> That's fine. Whatever, dude. <laughs> All right. I'm not changing positions because this lighting is not flattering. Oh, you, I was about to say you look great, but I, un I understand lighting is everything. Thank you. I feel like I just need this elevated. <laughs> okay. Figured it out. Oh, there's your face. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Are you at home? Uh, at, well, I assume yep. you're in bed, you're at home. I am. Cool. He's in a random bed. Huh? Someone's bed. Who knows? Uh, it's a couch, but... <laughs> At least he's not shirtless. We were, like, in a meeting the other day with a bunch of students, and someone had no shirt on. Oh, that was probably <laughs> Andy. You remember Andy? Andy Robleski? No, it was a, a current student. I, I know. Believe. what she's being. Uh oh. <laughs> and yes, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> we, we lived in the, um, what was, what was the apartment? Uh, was it Sonoma Village? Was the, is that the, you know, the apartment complexes that are close? Down the way to, from Tempe. They're close to Gilbert. Gilbert? Oh, oh the, the Gilbert one, like around the corner. Uh, no, it was, it was technically in Mesa. Uh, what were they called? I can't remember the name of the apartment complex that I lived in, but Andy lived on the other side in one of the apartments, like across the courtyard. And he would just stand outside all day with no shirt on. And we used to give him, we used to give him so much crap about it. <laughs> He's working on his tan, man. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> So Sydney, why don't you let's start, I guess, when did you graduate? I graduated in 2015. Um, I came to Los Angeles in December of 2015 after I finished my program and started an internship right here at East West. You've been there ever since. Yeah, it's been just over four years now. Time flies. It's crazy, especially in LA. Everything moves so fast in LA. Doesn't matter what you're doing. All the traffic, you know, sitting in traffic for two hours a day, it ages you. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and what were you doing before coming to Crass? So um, I had like many, uh, I wouldn't call them careers. I had one career before I decided to pursue audio engineering. I was a flight attendant um, for about a year and a half. And that was the last career, um, like th the last job in which I had dedicated most of my focus um, when I decided to sort of move into audio engineering. And while I was a flight attendant, I had purchased I think it was actually before I was a flight attendant. I get my timelines mixed up, but I purchased my own equipment to start learning how to record myself. Um, I was a vocalist. Um, everyone gets on me for referring to it in a past tense, but I was dedicated to being a singer um, in the past. And at the time I wanted to record myself 
um, because I knew that I couldn't afford to record in a studio like this. So um, I did that. And um, a friend of mine who was enrolled uh, in a film program at a local college in Minneapolis um, asked me to help him with production sound for his short films. So um, I started doing that and it was awful. It was so bad. I mean, like looking back now, the audio was terrible, but I had a lot of fun doing it. And I thought to myself, like, if I can make money doing this for a living, I want to. So I started looking into um, schools in my area, schools in my city, um, and I was about to sign sign the dotted line and uh sign away all of my uh you know i was about to take full responsibility for all of the financial obligation that would have been involved in enrolling at this local um school called ipr in minneapolis and um i just had a really bad feeling about it the tuition was pretty ridiculous, um, even though it was local. And so I was like, you know what? I need, I need a little bit more time to think about this. And um, so I left that day and that night, um, I did some research about like other schools out of state and I found Crass online and um, I mean, I was really impressed by uh, the sort of like discography and the, the, you know, all of the projects that had resulted um, from the careers of Crass graduates. Um, and I was impressed by the internship program. Um, so, when I compared the cost between attending school at Crass out of state, like literally uprooting my whole life, moving all the way across the country, and then attending school in a new state, that cost was literally less than it would have cost me to go to school in state at IPR. So I was like, you know what? I'm leaving. <laughs> So um, I applied and uh, yeah, I came out here and I, and I started the program. And um, so when you started your internship or during your time on campus, did you know that you wanted to go to East West? Was that a goal of yours? Oh yeah. Um, I think I was in first cycle. If you dig through, <laughs> If you dig through um, the the crass videos on YouTube, you'll find a video um, in which we're having a manager's panel at crass. I was in first cycle and I remember I was the first person to walk up to um, Candace and Paula and I can't remember the other. Is it Destiny? From Chicago. Oh, Crystal. Yeah, Crystal. Yeah. I walked up to them and I asked them a question about being a woman in the industry and that wasn't, and their response is not exactly what, what, uh, what gave me, um, the motivation to come to Los Angeles and work at East West, but hearing Candace talk about the work ethic here, the work ethic expected at East West in comparison to the sort of like corporate vibe at Capitol, hearing Candace speak about the work ethic here at East West made me want to come here because I knew that I was going to have to cut my teeth. I knew that it was going to be hard and I wanted that. I wanted a challenge and I wanted to take on that challenge and earn the opportunity to work with all of the really like influential artists that we work with here at East West. And so from <laughs> from cycle one, I knew that I wanted to work for Candace at East West. And so that, that became my goal. And part of, um, part of getting there was, um, I didn't get all the certifications. I don't know. I just didn't feel like that was 
my number one priority, although I do encourage it. Um, I focused on maintaining a 4.0 GPA. I focused on uh, networking with all of the instructors, building relationships with my instructors. I focused on getting to know um, our director, who at the time was Mike Jones. Who? Um, sorry. <laughs> Mike Jones. <laughs> um, so I, I focused on all of that. I had 100% attendance. Uh, I made the, what, it, what was it called? The director's list? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I made the director's list. And um, I remember one day walking, I know I'm going off and I don't even remember what your original question was, but I'm just, I'm just continuing. This is um, great. <laughs> this is great. And I just want to make a little note since I was on campus when Sydney was, uh, you lived there. I did. Like, you lived there, you participated in every event, you helped out at open houses, like you just made yourself known to everybody. Yeah. And not in an obnoxious way, which is, that can happen. Yeah. Like you were just available and like always friendly to, and like every instructor knew you. Totally. I yeah. took, I mean, I wanted to be involved in all of like the, um, extracurricular events and, um, the open houses, uh, and I had a lot of experience in guest service, so I used all of that experience to my advantage when we were um, putting on the open houses. And I would like, I was out there recruiting students. <laughs> I was like, you need to come to school here, and this is why. And um, I, you know, obviously admissions, administration appreciated that, I'm sure. But um, my goal was not necessarily to kiss ass and brown nose. It was to be a part of the community, to build the school up, to invest as much of um, myself in the program as I could. And so um, I remember one day I was walking in the lobby at Gilbert and uh, Mike Jones, his office is like, or it was, was across from reception, right? So he was in his office and he was in there talking with an instructor and it was one of the instructors that I had built this relationship with. And I knew that Mike Jones was a busy guy and like not everyone in the school is necessarily going to have the opportunity to like sit down and have one-on-ones with him throughout their program. You know, uh, there's a lot of people and, you know, not necessarily a lot of time to do that, but because I had, um, but because I had built this relationship with this instructor, I like sort of popped my head in the door and I was like, Hey, how you doing? And he was like, Oh, hi, Sydney. You know, Mike Jones, blah, blah, blah. And we were talking and Mike Jones was like, yeah, I know who you are. Um, I see that you're working really hard. I see that you're at all of the extracurricular events. Um, what studio is it that you are considering uh, pursuing after your program here at Crass? And I was like, well, to be honest, I want to work at East West. And he was like, I think that's a great idea. And I don't do this very often, but I'm going to reach out to Candace personally and give you um, a recommendation. And so he did. And I know that Candace spoke with Rachel and um, by the time, and this is like really fast forward, but by the time I was here at East West having an interview with Candace, she was like, I'll be honest with you. I know that you have a 4.0 uh, GPA. I know that you were on the director's list. You have recommendations from Mike Jones. He's a close friend of mine. I want to hire you today, but you have to do an internship. So it was, I was like a shoe in because I had put in all of this work leading up to the moment. And I had, I had focused, I had stayed focused while I was in school um, and, it, and it paid off. Yeah, paid off big time, it's awesome. And we know that Candace loves uh, people who have customer service experience Yeah, prior. Yes. Yeah. yeah, she appreciates um, guest service experience and she also has a soft spot for people who have been in the service, military, yeah. Yeah, um, quick question. 
was that poster of Daryl up in, in, at the Gilbert campus when you were a student? Yes, it was. So you uh, went to East West and you recognized him right away? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 I don't know that it was his face, but I, I remember seeing the schedule and being like, oh man, Daryl Thorpe is going to be here. And um, we used to poke fun when we were in school at this giant poster and we, was like, we were just like, who's this golden child? You know, who's this golden child, Daryl Thorpe? But like when I met him at the studio, he was super cool. Um, he immediately like, uh, there was like this immediate camaraderie because we came from the same, you know, the same roots. We came from Crass and we were both pursuing engineering and um, he was very supportive of my career and it got to the point where we had built this friendship and he requested me to be on sessions with him and we're still friends to this day. Yeah, and he is a super nice guy. He is. Um, we've had many craft students go through East West and get hired. Um, how many do you currently have on staff? Now I know like David down there and uh, <laughs> Uh, Daryl, they're now freelance engineers as well as Will, um, but are they still coming in and working on projects? Yeah, um, there are a lot of uh, crass grads that have gone freelance that continue to do uh, sessions here. Um, Candace likes to, <sighs> there's more to this question than, than just that simple answer. When, when Candace brings on an intern, she intends to hire. So if your internship goes well, um, you will get a job at the end of your internship. Um, so if you don't get a job, your internship probably didn't go so well. <laughs> um, but uh, so the people that are here are meant to learn as much as possible and become the best engineers that they can in in probably I want to say like the the maybe like four or five years that they work here as a staff engineer and then Candace wants those people to move on and become freelance engineers she doesn't really keep house engineers there are engineers that work here who have been here for a long time now but for the most part people grow and move on you know they build um they build a portfolio and then they go out and they uh work for an artist or a producer or they're just freelance and they have enough clientele build up from working here and networking here that they can support themselves as a freelance engineer so she keeps those people um, basically in her little black book and she calls them up every time she needs someone uh, when our guys can't cover it or when she knows like she'll she'll call David Davis when we need a producer to step in and, and work on like some pop or you know whatever the genre might be David Davis can do anything but um, she'll she'll call these guys uh, when <laughs> uh, when she needs someone yeah um... Candace is like a mama bear and she's a great person to have in your corner for sure. Yeah. And she'll, she'll rip someone apart as a mama bear would too. So don't, don't mess with her peeps. <laughs> <laughs> very true. And we're very lucky as crass to have her on our, on our um, advisory board. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. She's proud of that too. Ask her about it. She's proud to be a, a part of the advisory board. Yeah, and it's such a bummer because before all this COVID stuff hit, um, we were supposed to be hanging out with them in June, right? Um, yeah, it's sad. A lot of stuff isn't happening because of COVID. Like, uh, they were supposed to go to South By, and South By got canceled. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. Um, okay, so take us through. You, now you're an intern, um, and you started assisting with Daryl or thirding, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, what happened then? So um, I'll go back to the day of my interview. Um, my, uh, my interview obviously went well. And um, so she was uh, 
during during the interview they were very busy you know i was probably there for like two hours for my interview because they kept having to like step out of the room or take a booking call or or whatever might have been happening that that uh took their attention away from the interview so um obviously it was very busy at the studio that day and um i was supposed to start maybe like a couple days later but i but i i was told at crass by my instructors that when i go to my interview i need to bring a pair of shoes and maybe a change of clothes with me just in case they need my help so i told candace while i was there for my interview hey if you need the extra help today I have some sneakers in my car and I'll jump in and start helping out. And she was like, well, you know, we don't usually do that, but we do need some help right now. So go get your shoes. And I started immediately after my interview. Um, so I was really thankful that I listened to my instructors in regards to that. Um, but uh, when my, when my internship started, um, David Davis was one of the, assistant engineers working here. Um, a lot of the guys that were working here are no longer here anymore and they've moved on to do freelance work or work with artists and producers now. But um, uh, during my internship, uh, and this is something that I tell people that I train now, like when we hire new interns or runners, this is something that I tell them about for, months i felt like i couldn't do anything right i felt like every day i learned something new and every day i fucked something up and um and what i also tell interns now is um you're gonna feel like that for a long time and it's okay to mess up but you just can't make the same mistake more than once so if you set up a mic incorrectly um, to east-west standards, not necessarily to the standard that you learn in school, but to east-west standards, if I didn't set up that mic correctly, it's okay, and um, and I won't, you know, I won't be necessarily in trouble for doing something wrong, but I can't do it again once somebody has showed me how to do it correctly, I have to make sure that it's correct every single time thereafter. Um, and that sort of sets successful uh, interns and runners apart from those who are not successful and don't stick around. Um, you have to get the job done well and, and you have to be able to learn quickly. Um, and I think that, uh, that was one of the most intimidating parts about being being uh, an intern here is is learning everything that there is to know because aside from you know the setups and the teardowns, um, there are other things that you have to learn like what engineers expect, what staff engineers expect from you, um, like we had a staff engineer here who had this like nickname for a beverage that he <laughs> that he ordered from various coffee shops and so it was like basically the same drink at every coffee shop that you went to but with like minor differences in the recipe at every place you go to and you have to know you have to remember what that is for every single coffee shop that you go to. So if you go to commissary, it's it's one thing. If you go to Starbucks, it's another thing. And his shorthand, the, his nickname for this drink was my drink. And and it literally got worse than that. He would just write MD. He would just write MD on a piece of paper and expected you to know. And it, it got worse than that because he would literally just walk up to you and say, he would just hand you his card and you had to determine based on the time of day, whether or not he just had a meal, what it is that he wanted. And you knew that if it was like 
after lunch and he had just had lunch that he either wanted a drink from commissary or he wanted his special chocolate snack from Rite Aid. It's like, <laughs> there's a lot to know and it's super intimidating. And if you mess up, people will make fun of you. <laughs> so um, I know there's a lot more to say about uh, the internship process here, but I think I need some more questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then, so now you are assistant manager along with Chop Months and Chops, right? Yeah. Um, so how did that come about? Oh boy. Um, well, obviously between my internship and being an assistant manager, um, quite a bit happened. So, uh, eventually my internship came to an end and that was like a little over a month that I was, uh, working for free. Um, and then I was a runner and I was a runner probably for about, I want to say like a year before I started um, assisting on sessions. Um, what's cool about uh, working at East West is that you're sort of, well, granted there's the opportunity to, you're weaned into assisting. So um, as a runner, you're expected to learn the rooms use the gear, use the consoles, use the outboard gear, do routing after hours, use the mics, learn what the mics are for, how they're used in different different applications, uh, study the assistant engineer's miking techniques and and ask questions about mixing and ask questions about repairing gear, uh, talk to our uh, technician, um, our chief technician Lawrence about uh, how, you know, how to fix a module on the, uh, on the Trident in Studio 3. You know, you learn all of these things while you're a runner. And then um, when management feels that it's time for you to start assisting, what they'll do is schedule you on a session with Keith, who is the assistant manager here. And um, he'll sort of gauge your progress gauge uh, where you are, um, your proficiency, uh, how you vibe on a session. Um, I remember my first session with Keith. Um, <laughs> after the session, he basically told me that I need to shut the fuck up <laughs> and that I and that I talk too much. Um, and he he was right. I mean, to a certain extent, you, you kind of oh, just good. need to, <laughs> you kind of just need to shut up and uh you know it's not our job as engineers to give um to give artists our opinion about their music or their performance that's sort of what a producer is for um and we're not producers we're there to make sure that we capture the sound that they want um and so uh i I had to pull back on that and sort of evaluate how I was interacting with the clients during a session, but Keith still felt that I performed well. And so he, they started scheduling me as an assistant on sessions. And what that looked like was um, uh, at first uh, I was just a third engineer. So there would be obviously the first engineer a second engineer, which is the assistant engineer, and then me as a third engineer would basically be like a dedicated runner for the session. So I'd be in the room um, most of the time. I'd be in the room and I'd just be waiting for someone to tell me like, go swap that cable, uh, go uh, check all the headphone boxes, go uh, take an, a food order from all of the clients. And so you're sort of there as the glue, making sure that everything keeps moving um, and and holding together during the session. Um, and then once, uh, once I could be trusted um, as a third engineer, I started moving into a second engineer assistant positions. And um, I, I assisted people like David. I, I remember me and David were on a session in um, Studio Two with uh, 
Ty Taylor doing a jazz album. And that was a lot of fun. It was super intimidating though, because there was like cables everywhere. It was like a, <laughs> it was like a rat's nest of cables. It was so much fun. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of opportunities to work with some really cool artists. Um, eventually, uh, I was eventually i was granted the opportunity of being a first engineer on some sessions and um uh what's interesting is that uh sometimes as an assistant engineer you're thrown in as the first engineer so um you might be scheduled to assist an engineer or a producer and the during the booking process uh, management will be under the impression that that person who is the first engineer is going to be, you know, running Pro Tools or getting sounds or, you know, um, uh, positioning mics or whatever it might be that a first engineer is expected to do. But sometimes those people just want to sit in the corner of the room and let you do all that heavy lifting. And so even though that's not your title, sometimes you got to jump in and take on those responsibilities. Um, and I found myself in, in that situation more than a couple of times. I remember being on a, um, on a Nipsey Hustle session in this room actually. And um, there was no, there was no first engineer there. And I jumped in and I was on tools for hours and hours and hours and um uh i mean i didn't obviously get credit for any of the music that was released as a result of that session but um i can say that i did work on some of that music as a first engineer uh, all that matters is what i know <laughs> so um yeah i i did some first engineering and eventually um I decided that I wanted to get more involved in the booking process. And so uh, I talked to Candace about, um, well, really, it was actually Candace, I think, who had the idea of putting me in a position in which I was the weekend manager. So I started working at the front desk on the weekends. Um, and I I was considered an assistant manager. Um, so I was sort of responsible for delegating tasks, um, sometimes handling scheduled conflicts or, you know, handling booking. I took booking calls over the weekend and sort of gave Candace and Keith some time off uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. And during that time, I was managing on the weekend but then during the week i was also running i was also assisting it was a very like very busy time yeah no sleep that's exactly right um it was a very busy time for me and it was pretty overwhelming um and eventually uh i decided to move into a management position full time um and obviously it wasn't up to me to make that decision, but what I decided is that I was going to sort of prepare this pitch uh, for Candace and Keith and Lawrence, of course, who is also my manager, uh, the chief technician here, chief engineer. Um, so I prepared this, um, I guess you could call it a speech. I, I prepared this speech and um, I asked for them to meet with me and we sat down in the office and I I was like shaking um, because this, this position didn't exist. There was nobody who held this position before I did. It was something that I literally like pulled out of my ass and was like, hey, what do you guys think? And so that's what happened. I sat in the office with them and I read them my pitch. And before I even finished, Candace was like, yes, yes, I love this. Let's do it. Uh, so I started, um, I started managing uh, full time from the front desk, which 
has its downfalls. Uh, people assume that you're a receptionist when you sit there, but it's okay. Uh, no hard feelings. So um, yeah, I started doing that uh, five days a week. So I was full time and uh, I became more and more involved in the booking process. I'm copied on all of the email chains uh, between management and clients. Um, I spend a lot of time communicating with labels, uh, processing payments, um, sort of coordinating uh, every step of the way. So initially when we get a call, obviously the client is looking for time. We have to figure out what studio best serves their needs. Um, like, obviously, if you want to track a full band, you're not going to do it in Studio 5. You're probably going to do it in Studio 2, maybe Studio 3, even Studio 1. But based on the sound that they want, we determine which room is best suited for their project. Um, and that, uh, that was one of the reasons why Candice uh, was so supportive of the idea because I do have a background in engineering and I can, and I have worked in these rooms as an engineer. Um, I've also cleaned these rooms. I've also cleaned the toilets. You know, I know the studio in and out. And so the booking process comes very, uh, comes very easy to me because I understand every single aspect of the recording or mixing or whatever fill in the blank process um, that takes place in the rooms here. So um, yeah, I started doing that full time and uh, I think it's been like maybe two years or something. I don't even remember when this change happened, but uh, I really enjoy it. So that's where I am right now. Um, and I guess technically my title is technically studio operations. I guess that's what you call it. So, yeah. Dude, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Love this. Love Pretty cool. This. Um, now, for, you know, for when people move from internship, um, just kind of in general, you know, for our grads and students to hear, you know, how long do you think they should wait I mean, you said you were nervous to kind of bring up this job position that you you had conjured all yourself. Yeah. Um, when would you say it's appropriate for, for someone in the studio to start asking for a little like leverage? Mm. I think that's reliant upon um, uh, the studio and the management team because uh what's okay with one person may not be okay with another person um so it it really depends on who it is that you're that you're working for candace super cool super down to earth um wants the best for her staff all the time interested in seeing you succeed on every level um and so uh she's very easy to talk to in general um no matter who you are you're the custodian you're a world famous producer whoever you are candace can get on your level and talk to you um as a human being and so that makes her approachable right away but um as far as like uh knowing that it's okay to ask her for something, um, it took a long time for me to, uh, well, first of all, I had to, I had to know exactly what it was that I wanted. I couldn't just go in there and be like, hey, you know, I'm thinking like maybe this was, this would be like a good idea. It, it was like well thought out. I presented it to her with a lot of information. And I think that that was part of the reason why uh, it was received so well because I spent a lot of time, I I did a lot of pre-production and made sure that I had like this um, presentation and that it made sense and that uh, Candace would be able to understand what it was that I wanted and why I felt that um, I had the qualifications to do so. 
And so I don't know that it's necessarily a matter of time as much as it is um, the relationship that you've built with your management. Um, and I think that that is reliant upon the job that you do and the performance um, that you have while you're at work. Uh, when you're outside of work, do you show up when, when management calls you in the middle of the night asking you to come in for a last minute booking? Um, do, you, uh, do you show up when someone else is sick um, and there's no one else there to cover? Like, are you available? Um, do you work hard when you're here? Are you a cool hang? Like, if you've got all of this um, established, if management understands uh, who you are and that investing in you is a good idea, then, then you'll be ready to have that conversation. They'll be ready to receive that information and that proposal from you. Hey, you mentioned that you actually were a runner for a year. Yeah. Before you started really assisting. Yeah. How do you, you know, to some people that might be really long. They'll start to complain that like, it's I'm not, not getting hands on. I'm not doing yeah. anything. How did I you have maintain? a story? Yeah. I have a story for you. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say his name because that would be mean. Mm. Um, but we, um, oh man, we had a guy uh, start an internship here. And um, he seemed really cool at first. Um, and uh, I remember the day he came in for his internship. Uh, he, was, he was working for a while and I would give him task after task. Like, I need you to go pick up this food. I need you to clean the kitchen. I need you to clean the bathroom. He was doing a lot of cleaning because surprise, surprise, that's mostly what an intern does. Like we have to trust you to keep the studio clean before we can trust you to touch a mic. I mean, like, isn't that kind of common? I feel like that's common sense. Maybe yeah. not, I don't know. But um, that's what we learned in school. I mean, that's, that's what we were taught is that uh, you had to be able to trust me with a broom before you could trust me with a vintage <clears throat> or like an SSL console. And so, um, this guy started working and he was there for like a couple hours, right? And um, I, uh, I grabbed a t-shirt for him, like an East West shirt. And I was like, here, uh, can you try this on and let me know if it fits? Um, and if it's not the right size, I'll get you a different size. So I hand it to him, he walks away. And a couple minutes later, he walks back up to me at the front desk with his training packet and with his shirt in his hands. And I'm busy, like I'm working, but obviously when he walks up to me, I sort of turn my attention to him. And so he's like, um, I don't think this is gonna work out. And he's like handing me, he's handing me the shirt. And I'm like, oh, is it not the right size? And uh, he was like, no, I mean, uh, I mean, working here. And I was like, um, I, you know, I don't remember what I said word for word, but I was just like, okay, uh, why is that? And um, this was his first day. He hadn't even got, he got like halfway maybe through his first day. And he was like, you know, I just, uh, I just thought that I'd be spending more time, you know, in the rooms and, and uh, working like with the gear and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, okay, you know, I could have just like let him have it, but I was just like, you know what? You just made your decision. Sounds good to me. Like if you're not willing to clean on the first day of your internship, you're not supposed to be here. So I was like, all right, well, um, are you gonna leave now then? Are you gonna take off? And he was like, yeah, I'm gonna go. And so he handed me his stuff and he just fucking walked out the door. And I, I remember telling Candace about this. And she was just like, what? <laughs> That's Please like tell me that of. wasn't a cross person. Was that a, was that, a, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. 
It does happen. Sometimes a- people don't want to hear what you have to say to them about yeah. the realities of these internships. And it is Very a ladder. True. It's a ladder to climb and a good, like you have to pay your dues. Like why on yeah. earth would you walk in and just touch all the gear? That makes no sense. Totally. Totally. But you know, it's all good. I don't know what happened to him or where he went, but I hope that he got to work with some gear. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, so running for, uh, just to go back to the running thing, because we obviously have students who are going to be doing that at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, running for an entire year could seem long to someone. Right. That's and the question. So um, I have known, okay. There are some studios that are, that are known to be like uh, intern farms. So I said earlier that Candace does not bring on an intern without the intent to hire. So obviously the internship process is like an interview. It's like an extended interview. Maybe he started his own cleaning. (laughs) I hope so. That was awesome. Um, So, uh, the internship process is like an interview. And so uh, just as the internship process is like an interview, your, uh, your career as a runner is also sort of like an interview. Like I said before, you spend your, your time as a runner learning the gear, learning the rooms, learning the ins and outs of the studios, of the whole studio, um, learning from the assistants. And honestly, I don't think that I'd be ready to be on a session before a year had passed in which I learned all of those things. I probably would have drowned, to be honest, especially when you're working with the clients that come here to East West, they have a specific expectation. Their standards are very, like their expectations are very high. We have a high standard here at East West. And so if you go into that room, unprepared it's going to show and the clients aren't just going to be like it's okay they're going to be like i don't ever want to work with you again candace who is this i want this session for free and so um not to like freak you out but that's just the reality you know and so i think a year is a reasonable amount of time um but honestly these internship farms these studios that just hire interns and let them go and bring in more interns and never hire. Um, I mean, I've heard of people doing internships at those studios for like multiple years, like three years not getting paid and they're, they're part time. So they're only at the studio like three days a week and they're not getting paid and they're expected to have another job on the side. And if I was expected to become the engineer that East West expects me to be while also having a part-time job, I would have never gotten to the point where I could have performed as an, an engineer, engineer here at East West. So that's, that's, I guess that's my response to the question is that like, it gets way worse. <laughs> it, can, it can be a hell of a lot longer than a year at some other studios. And um, how, how do you personally, and what would you suggest to um, someone going through that process as an intern to runner? How did you take that kind of criticism? Like you mentioned Keith telling you to shut up. You know, some people would be like, oh, how dare you, you know, and take it so personally and let it get in the way of their progress. By the way, I was told to shut up too when I was working projects with Scott, Mer- um, Scott and he told me to shut up. And nice. I was like, Scott would tell you to shut up. Yeah, and I, it, after, seriously, after that, I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. Um, yeah. But like, do you have suggestions for people like and, and being able to overcome those things where your pride gets in the way? Yeah, uh, just don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't have, you can't have that kind of pride and ego when you walk through the door. I mean, you, also, you, you obviously have to have healthy boundaries. Um, you know, uh, there have been engineers that I've come into contact with while I've been working here who have been, you know, kind of abusive, um, not physically, but Mm -hmm. I mean, like just their, their language or whatever. Um, And old timers who have been around for a long time will tell you that they used to have things thrown at them 
and that, uh, you know, they've had pencils thrown at their heads when they did something wrong. But like um, having healthy boundaries, but also recognizing that you don't know everything. You don't, you, you really don't know shit. And these people who are uh, giving you constructive criticism are sharing all of this really valuable knowledge with you. And they're sharing years. I mean, they've accumulated years, sometimes decades of experience and you have the opportunity to learn from them. And sometimes that means that you're getting a uh, constructive criticism or sometimes just criticism, but you know, you have to take it as, um, as sort of like a, like a gift as yeah. an opportunity. Like a compliment that they care enough to tell you what you're doing wrong. Yes, exactly. Yeah. There's, I, I'm not going to remember what movie it is, but, uh, there is a movie in which this girl is just like, uh, how come you're always picking on me? At like, oh, it's uh, Love and Basketball, I think, where she's like, coach, how come you're always like, how come you're always like bagging on me? And how come you're always on my back? And uh, the coach was just like, the, the minute that I have nothing to, like, this isn't word for word, but the minute I have nothing to say to you, like, you basically know that I have no interest in seeing you succeed. So yes, exactly. They're invested yeah. in you. Oh, David has a question for you. What? Do you see the chat? Oh, no. Hold on. What happens when you don't agree with what the ranking professional is doing because it impends? Do you mean impedes their workflow? What happens when you don't agree with what the ranking professional is doing because it impedes their workflow? Ah. Oh, no. Hey. I hey. knew you'd ask that question. <laughs> How do you know? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sweet. I just, okay. My phone died. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's basically like if you could help someone's session go smoother, but you don't want to be like yeah. stepping on their ego at the same time. Like yeah. say someone wanted to come in and record everything for one song all at once with the drum set up in one position, and then like 10 minutes later, they want to do it in the closet and set up all the mics in there. Right, oh. right. Um, that's, uh, man, those are really, um, I, I think that that, 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 that sort of plays into what I was saying about your relationship with your managers. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to feel the, the vibe of the room and, and sort of get an understanding of who that person is where their boundaries lie because some people are like they welcome they welcome your opinion they want to hear from you um they know that that uh you're not just like a bootlicker they know that you have knowledge and experience and they they want to hear from you but some guys don't some 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 people that you work with have no interest in hearing you and that's that's when it gets really difficult to communicate um you know, uh, <laughs> to communicate how something could potentially affect the session negatively. And I think that, um, man, how, do, I don't know how you explain that. It's sort of like a, a feeling, feeling the room. Feeling it out, yeah. Yeah. Determining, determining what words to use, you know, like, like I might, I might say sir to someone or I might say dude to another someone or like it's all about how you address the situation, but you never want to tell, you never want to tell somebody what they should be doing or that a decision that they're making is absolutely wrong. You sort of just want to present another idea like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I was also thinking that you know, we have this other option, we have another opportunity. And I think that this might save us some time or, you know, based on what I know about this room, I think that this might be uh, another great position. It's almost as if you're paying a compliment to the, to the decision that they've already made while offering another alternative. Right, you're basically like telling them that it's their idea in a, in a way, in like a decision. Yeah. 
David, you yeah. you you sound like you've uh, had that kind of experience before. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> both sides, but it's good because you can learn uh, what to do and what not to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, over year over time. Yeah, but uh, you walk into that room with no ego, but you have to recognize that there is ego in the room that doesn't belong to you, and mm. you have to respect it. You have to you have to respect it, and you can't you can't just be like walking over people, stepping in front of people, telling them what to do. You know, you have to remember that you are there to assist. You're not there to run the show, run the show. Yeah. The client yeah. is the person who should be making the ultimate decisions. You just offer all of the solutions, you offer all of the opportunities, and then they ultimately well either they ultimately decide or you ultimately help them to make the decision <laughs> you, you're like a spirit guide mm. <laughs> you're, so you're like you're in the woods i don't know holding a stick and you're like do you want to go this way or this way <laughs> yeah 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 that's perfect this way he's gonna be crackling out <laughs> yeah <laughs> but we're not talking about ayahuasca <laughs> i am <I'm> just... <laughs> That's, I think that's a great uh, segue, actually, to address um, drug use. Oh, let's hear it. And alcohol use. I'm sure that studio. never happens in the studio. Never. <laughs> so, okay, so this is a really unusual, unprecedented time. And we've had to set um, some new policies in place. So right now, um, none of our clients are allowed to smoke anything inside the building um that has to be done outside but in in a normal non-pandemic time um we allow we allow people to partake in those sorts of activities in the rooms hmm. um and so uh part of part of your job is to be like cool to be a good hang and um from the perspective of some clients, that means that you're partaking in the same uh, activities that they are. And so, um, like, I've had clients in a session with me, like, passing around a joint, or many, or hitting a bong, or drinking, or whatever it is, and they'll offer me, right? And so, it took me a long time to figure out how to handle that situation. Um, but what, what, what I finally decided would be my response every time is, you know, I can't really function when I'm intoxicated and I want to give you the best possible outcome here. So I'm going to stay sober. You go ahead, you enjoy but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass. And that's hard to do when you're working with Nipsey Hussle <laughs> or, you know, whoever it is. Um, Someone's gotta fly the ship. Yeah, and they respect it, you know? Um, I wouldn't just turn them down and be like, nah, man, no, nah, I don't do that. Cause you don't, you don't wanna offend them. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to think that you're judging them for, for doing so or that you have a problem with it you just want to say you know not me um i'm focused on working right now and i want to make sure that we have a successful session which means that i need to not be inebriated so um i did have an experience once and this was a very this was a very casual session because i was actually working with keith our assistant manager here he had me assisting him on a session here in studio five and it was like no pressure really it was like some of his friends recording and mixing and um they were all drinking like this craft beer like super delicious different types of craft beer but i'm a lightweight like super lightweight and i don't drink anymore i haven't had a drink in over a year but when i when i was assisting him i was still drinking and um they gave me some beer to try. And so I had a sip, but it was obviously something that I had never, I've never had before. So going into it, I didn't really know what the outcome would be. 
and I was I was buzzed enough that I couldn't I couldn't patch. I was buzzed enough that my brain was foggy and I couldn't make patches. And it it went for a while until I couldn't for a while until the the buzz had passed. I was totally useless. And so it's important to make that decision with enough forethought to say like to to weigh the pros and cons because we're not we're not necessarily going to come condemn you if you like have a drink with a client while you're working as long as you do your job as long as you uphold the east west standard and you perform to the best of your ability um that's what's important that the session goes on, that it goes on well, and that you are performing at your at your highest level. Um, and I just know that that is not possible if I'm intoxicated in any way. That kind of brings up another question along these lines. I would love, because now you're at a point where you train the new interns and you're, you know, directing them. Yeah. Have you, uh, without naming names, what what mistakes have you seen interns make that are just like painful? Any any yeah. stories that you can share with us? Um. Uh, so it it's sometimes hard for me to remember whether uh these things happened during the internship or when they were a staff sure. runner, but um. Uh, I have one example. So we had um, the the interns and the runners are expected to do um, sort of like maintenance around the building uh, when it's needed. Um, sometimes that means that you're cleaning. Sometimes that means that you're painting. Sometimes that means that you're building something. Um, we would never make somebody do something that was like outside of their level of expertise. But if you have experience or if it's a simple task like painting, um, then we ask for the runners or the interns to take care of stuff like that. Um, so there was a time when the monitors in Studio One needed to be painted. And I don't mean like the the obviously not the cones you know what i mean they were painting like around like the housing the housing of the monitors in studio one and so this guy was left to paint and he got paint on the cone and we're talking about like david how much do those monitors cost in studio one like fifty thousand dollars or something. Which ones? The the ATCs in Studio oh, One. Those are pretty much in every room. The main one, the mains. Yeah, the mains. Three hundreds, shit. <laughs> Fifty, sixty grand, I think, probably with the homie rate. Yeah, per, yeah. per monitor. Yeah. Because I think they probably got a deal because they're in like all the rooms. Yeah. And then they're like, East West is kind of an ATC studio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot. Too much. A lot. More than you could make here in probably two years. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, he painted the monitor and then, like the cone, he got paint on the cone and then he, like, covered it up. Not as in, like, physically, but, like, he didn't tell anyone that it happened. We had to see and find it for ourselves and then start doing an investigation. And um, so he was sort of being overseen by one of our staff. I think he was an intern at the time and that he was being overseen by one of our staff runners. And our staff runner ended up taking responsibility for the paint on the monitor um because that intern had not stepped forward and come clean about the fact that he painted the monitor and um 
the the runner didn't actually say like the intern did it i was responsible for him i'm taking responsibility he said uh i'm taking responsibility for the paint getting on the monitor so he was considerate enough and gracious enough to recognize for himself the runner to recognize for himself that he was technically responsible for what went on while that intern was painting the monitor but he didn't feel that it was necessary to share with management that it was actually the intern who painted the monitor that guy might have gotten fired i don't know you know it's hard to say what would have happened but um there's you can see like the two the two ends of the spectrum you have someone who who fucked up and then hit it and then you have someone who took responsibility for it even though it wasn't technically him who had um painted the monitor and so you can compare those two things and you can guess who's not here anymore and who is how did you guys find out ultimately that it wasn't him or her um some of us knew mm. i don't know if management ever found out um but i remember having a conversation with him about it and i remember thinking to myself like there's no way that he would have done this like there's no way that he would have gotten paint on the monitor and he sort of told us and was like yeah well it wasn't me it was the intern and we were just like why are you taking the fall for this and he was like it's okay you know i was supposed i should have been there i should have been keeping an eye on him and so he that's took a, that guy's amazing yeah <laughs> that's some strong character he's an assistant to spike stent now nice. yeah do you guys know who Spike Sten is? Look him up. Yes. Look him up. Um, You're just two, putting up a two-story Christmas tree? What? Oh, the, I think that was when you were talking about uh, duties that interns and runners have to do outside of regular. Oh, yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah. Yeah. We actually have a... Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna tell that story, never mind. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> All right, so um, you know, going I guess going back to like the kind of the smoking thing, like what what changes have you seen since COVID nineteen um, mm -hmm. at the studio and, and how do you expect those changes are gonna be moving forward? So like what can our interns expect? Yeah. Going um, into a post COVID recording studio well what better reason to take a mini tour of east west i'll show you some of the things that we're doing differently right now so you wanna come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination <laughs> i hope my uh wi-fi doesn't boot me out it's been good um, so far We'll see. I should automatically connect to the lobby Wi-Fi. So I'm not going to take you upstairs. I'm walking past VIP right now. There's our bathroom. So one thing you'll see here is that I don't really want to touch anything, but we have signs on every door uh, dedicating each stall to each room. Mm. So this is the staff stall. And then we also have one for each room so that's part of what we're doing um to limit exposure um bye oh i didn't even know you were here oh hey, bye Gerald. oh i didn't even realize hi miss you okay so we've placed signs throughout the building Whoop, maybe you lost her. Maybe she had to jump up on the other Wi-Fi. Did she freeze? Well, we'll give her a second. 
Hmm. Well, she'll be back. Hopefully. Lobby Wi Fi. <laughs> Actually, Whiffy. Whiffy. Someone next to me has their Wi-Fi named Pretty Fly for a Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> I'm like really amused by that. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> you guys laughed. <laughs> She's dumb. <laughs> oh, there she is. Hey. I knew that I would eventually get booted out. So I'll, just, I'll answer your question from here and then... I'll take you out to the lobby on my phone. Cool. Um, so we put up lots of signs uh, asking people to wear face masks. We have, um, we have a questionnaire that people have to fill out every day that they arrive at the studio. So it asks you basically wellness questions about your experience with COVID-19, like have you come into contact with anyone who's tested positive? Um, are you having any symptoms? Questions like that. So every person who comes into the building each day answers those questions. Um, we're also taking temperatures when people arrive. So we have infrared thermometers. Uh, when they walk through the door, they take their temperature, show a staff member, and then they fill out that questionnaire. Um, we also have, uh, obviously social distancing in place. Um, we have capacities for each room. So each, con each control room is limited to two people. Um, in this room, the ISO is obviously pretty small. So uh, that's a limit of two people. So in studio five here, control room and live room together, you can only have four people at a time. Um, we do, we do respect the fact that clients may choose to um, not observe social distancing with each other. Um, we can't stop people from becoming like closer than six feet with each other. We, um, we then, uh, if, that, if that's the case and they want to have more people in the control room or in the live room than our capacity allows, we have given our assistants the um, free reign to leave the room. So if they feel uncomfortable, if they feel safe, they can just step out of the room. Um, so it's really important to us to protect the safety of our staff, um the safety of our clients uh we have updated our website to include some information regarding what we are doing in response to covid19 so we're making every effort um possible i bought a bunch of hand sanitizer um we keep all of our hand washing stations fully stocked um and we do round the clock uh once every hour we disinfect the building. Uh, we're disinfecting the consoles. We've got these um, alcohol solutions that we're using to disinfect the gear. Um, although we do recognize the fact that this is, this is valuable and oftentimes vintage gear that can't necessarily handle the kind of disinfecting that we need to use to ensure that people are safe and that they're not contracting the virus from touching a potentiometer. So we are trying to uh, encourage our engineers only to use what is absolutely necessary so that they are only disinfecting, you know, a portion of the console or some of the gear versus all of it. So if they only need two channels, then we ask that they limit themselves to the two channels instead of 
moving around on the whole board, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, totally. I'm gonna try to join the meeting from my my cellular device. Jeff Harris just popped on too. Oh, hi, Jeff. Hello. I think I'm not seeing everyone. I need to. Hey, Sydney. Hi. Hello. How are you? Uh, do you feel safe in LA? <laughs> I feel safer than people feel in Minneapolis. There you go. Yeah. yeah. We were talking about that before the meeting started. I have family that lives out there. Wow. Yeah. I just got in a little late here, but uh, I just wanted to see you. Well, it's nice to see you. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm gonna turn the camera on. It's pretty ugly, though. Uh, I don't believe you. Uh, You're silly, Jeff. <laughs> okay, I'm oh. joining the meeting in progress. Mo has a question. How are you communicating this information with clients? Are you having to contact them? Or are they coming to ask you? Yeah, so um, people generally want to know. Um, they'll usually during, uh, like at some point during the first booking call um, or email, they'll ask us how we are responding, what we're doing um, to protect clients and the staff. And um, aside from just spelling it out, you know, writing it out in email, explaining all of the measures that we've taken, all the precautions that have been taken, um, we do have that page on our website where they can read about all of the measures that we've taken. Um, one thing that I didn't mention we are doing that we are is um, uh, we've installed these uh, UVC lights in our HVAC systems that uh, basically kill everything that passes through our air conditioning units. That's so, awesome. It's not traveling throughout the building if we can help it. Yeah. I'm uh, sure that, that wasn't cheap, huh? No. But, you know, it's a small cost to make sure that people are protected. Yeah, right. Let's see. I'm trying to join with my phone so I can take you to the lobby. We see ya. Okay, cool. Let me just mute here. I'm turning down the audio on my computer so I don't have any feedback. Hold on a second. Do, 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 do. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, let's go to the lobby. All right, different perspective. Cool. Let me just stick this on my face. Okay, so here we go. Now we won't get disconnected because I don't have to rely upon the Wi-Fi. Okay, just sneak through here and turn the camera around so you can see. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to record our clients, but you'll see that we have red tape on the floor. And then I'll read all three of you to also sign this wellness agreement form here. Oh, there's Kat. Kitty Kat, say hi, Kat. Hi. Hi, Kat. Kat has this cool, like, boxer style barrier. I'm doing a live stream, guys. Sorry, I don't want you to be recorded if you don't want to be. Okay, so as you could see, our clients are currently um, taking their temperatures as they walk into the building. Um, and then Kat will have them fill out the wellness form. There are more signs posted around the building. And then... Um, in addition to the thermometer station that's at the front door, there's another one of our signs that's up. We also have another thermometer station, which is here by the back door, giving people instructions regarding how to use the thermometers. 
And then we also have, last but not least, other signage on both the front door on Sunset as well as the parking lot door here at the rear of the building. So there you have it. Those are our safety precautions. <sighs> These masks are hard to breathe through. They are. How long have you been open now? Uh, for booking? Yeah. Um, it's kind of a difficult question to answer because uh, we've, uh, we were shut down for a few weeks um, and we weren't taking any bookings, but we were looking for upper, other opportunities um, that didn't require us to be here in person. So mm -hmm. we were technically trying to book, but just didn't necessarily have the opportunity to do so. Um, but we've had sessions in for, I want to say like two weeks now. That's good. Well, we just, yeah. opened, we, we just reopened today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that you guys did orientation and yeah. How'd that go? Well, it's still going. I think I left there a couple of hours ago. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, two perspectives. <laughs> cool. Okay. I'm going to kill this one. Okay. So how about all you guys in the chat? Do you guys have any questions for Sydney? Yeah. yeah. Ask her. yeah. Oh. Okay. Amateur. It looked like you had UV in the hallways as well. Was that for? Th uh, those are black lights. Decorative. Those are uh, those are just our black lights. We have black lights in the halls around the lounges. So it, it illuminates the walls. It doesn't kill the virus. It would have been nice if it did, but it's not a strong enough UV light. Can you, can you share maybe like what a day looked like for you when you were intern versus like runner, like what time you got there, what time you left, kind of, I know you talked about some of the jobs you did and then as kind of like a follow up, I guess. And if you don't want to answer this, you don't feel comfortable, that's totally fine. Just kind of wondering, just curious what like a runner gets paid at yeah. some East West. Yeah, sure. So um, typical day non-pandemic as an intern. Um, that uh, the, the arrival time and the departure time as far as your shift is concerned really depends upon uh, what sessions we have scheduled here. So um, if we have a string session, you know, the session might get started as early as like 7 a.m., which means that you would need to be here early enough to open the building, finish any setup that might need to be done. Um, so you could be here as early as like 5 a.m. sometimes, um, which is rare. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. On a normal day, uh, we open at 8 a.m. So our runners get here at 8 a.m or at least the first runner gets here at 8 a.m. Uh, reception gets in at nine, and then uh, management usually rolls in around like 10 or 11, depending. Um, and then you would be working here at East, East West, at least you would be working an eight hour day shift. Um, and then in the afternoon, someone would come in to sort of take your place, take over where you left off. Um, and the night shift is where it can get a little long because we don't have a third shift. So if you start at 5 p.m. and then a session goes until 3 a.m., you need to stay on shift until the session ends so that you can uh, tear down and clean up afterward, um, close down the building. So the night shift is where um, the overtime sometimes comes into play. Uh, it doesn't always happen, especially not now, but um, uh, <laughs> pre-pandemic, it was definitely, it would definitely not be uncommon for you to be working overtime at night. Uh, for, for interns, it's very rare. For a runner, it's fairly common. Um, for interns, we, we generally don't ask for overtime. 
um, only if we're in a really, really uh, tight position in which we need the extra help. Like if we have four sessions going till 3 a.m., we might ask an intern to stay for another hour or two past their eight hours. Um, and then to answer your second question, what was the second question? I was wondering how much typically a runner would get paid. Sure. So that's, that's usually um, minimum wage, usually. Um, I don't uh, typically handle, uh, you know, wages, but I think when I started working here, it was minimum wage, and I think that, to my knowledge, that's still the case. Um, that oh, changes. Then. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's Go okay. Ahead. People get raises, though. You know, um, once you've worked here for a certain amount of time, Candace will give you a raise. You know, if you're doing a good job and you've been here for like a year, she'll definitely make sure that you're taken care of. Awesome, thanks. So I guess I was just wondering, you know, it's LA, so it's expensive. Yeah. How did that work coming out to LA, not getting paid and then being yeah. paid on minimum wage? Like, how did you make that work? It's hard. Um, and I think that it's different for every single person. Um, I, I, when I came out here, you know, I actually almost didn't come to LA because I couldn't find a, a I couldn't find a place to live. Um, I couldn't find a roommate situation and I knew that that's what I needed because there's no way that I was going to be able to afford a place on my own. You know, the people who can afford a place on their own out here have help. <laughs> they have help in some way or they've saved money. Some people save a bunch of money and then they go to school and they're set for like the first you know, while they're in school and then the first year after school. And I really, if, if I could go back in time and do it that way, I might have done that instead. But uh, the reality is that that's not how I handled that situation. So um, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to go even further back and, and, and address like how I was able to afford school too. So um, when I came out to Arizona, I obviously moved across the country. Um, rent is really affordable in Arizona, thankfully. So I was able to find a place that was like 500 bucks a month. And I ended up having a roommate even. So that cut rent in half, but I didn't save up any money for school. So I maxed out a couple credit cards um, and I had my mom helping me pay for expenses while I was in school because I wanted to focus on my education and I didn't want to have a part-time job. Now that's not possible for everybody, obviously, but I was fortunate enough to have those opportunities to be able to focus on just school while I was in school. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'm still paying off that debt because it was a lot of debt that I got into, but um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it any other way, um, you know, being in the situation that I was in at the time. So then moving to LA, um, I found a roommate like a week, a week before the program was going to end and it was time to leave for internship. So, um, that was like, that was like a gift from God. Uh, I was like maybe going to go to Colorado or New York or something instead because I just didn't have, I hadn't figured it out for LA yet. So thankfully I found someone who was a crass grad that last minute needed a roommate. Um, and I lived, I lived with her for, God, how long was it? I think it was like, was it a year or two? I don't even remember. I think it was a year. I think it was a year that I was living there. And then eventually I got my own place in Hollywood. Um, I found a studio apartment in East Hollywood. So, okay. So my rent um, in Valley Village, which is the neighborhood that I lived in when I first came to LA, uh, where I lived with a roommate, my rent was my cut, my portion of the rent was $800 a month, my cut. And then when I found an apartment in East Hollywood, because I wanted my own space, I was done living 
with roommates. I wanted my own privacy. Um, I moved into, and I had obviously been at East West for about a year at that point, so I was getting paid. Um, I moved in, in into um, a studio apartment in East Hollywood, which was five minutes away from the studio, and I was paying 1100 a month just for rent with no parking. Let me tell you, if you're going to move to LA and you are looking for a place, try like hell to find a place with parking. Even if you got to pay for it, find a place with parking. I shit you not, I used to spend three hours after my shift looking for parking close to my apartment. I can't tell you how many times I have like slept in my car for a couple hours, parked illegally until 5 a.m. when I could sneak into a spot where somebody had left to go to work in the morning. So like just recognize how difficult parking in LA can be. The further you get away from the city, the easier it gets. I live in Alhambra right now and parking is so easy. I paid for a permit so I can park on the street where my house is and no problems. But when I was living in Hollywood, it was awful. So um, my apartment in East Hollywood was 1100 a month. And then obviously I had other expenses on top of that. And I was making um, minimum wage as a runner. So it was really hard. Um, it was really difficult to make ends meet. And, uh, you know, it was, I think that, you know, thankfully I had some help from my family. My family would send me money here and there. Um, you know, I would call my grandma and be like, grandma, I'm hungry. <laughs> and she would, you know, send me some money so that I could get some food or whatever. But, you know, the reality is, is that it's, it's hard. It's hard at first. And you have to make a lot of sacrifices. You have to like give up having internet at home sometimes or you have to live in a shitty apartment to be able to work at the studio that you want to work in um being an intern uh i think during my internship i was sort of just like god please let this internship end as soon as possible so i can start making money because i was doing the same thing uh, that I was doing when I was in school. I was putting it on my credit card. I was getting as much help from my family as I could. And I was just working like full time as an intern. So I wasn't bringing in any money. And I won't say that it's not possible to have another job while you're doing your internship at, at East West. But I will say that it's to your advantage to focus on east west and to give all of your time to your internship when you're here because candace relies upon interns to be available when she needs them so um we have had people do internships here with part-time jobs but they aren't here anymore say that <laughs> did that answer your question yeah, thank you so much. All of your answers are always just so detailed and ex huh, you just explain everything so thoroughly. I appreciate yeah, it. For sure. I, no, I've been there. I I don't like this. It's scary. You don't know how you're going to make it work. Um, there's There are so many variables and it's impossible to predict how things are going to go. And what I will say is that you just need to be, hi person. Hello. Who's that? Is that Alan Leggett? I like her thing. You can, you can talk. <laughs> oh, I don't know if she can hear me or not. I can hear you. I can't hear you. No. But hi. Uh, I just want to say hi. Sorry. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Alan fun. says hello. Hello, Alan. Oh, he couldn't hear me because you had your headphones on. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't realize I was screaming in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. So I know how it is. Ask me any questions you want. Literally, if you're thinking, I don't know if I should ask this question, just ask it. Just do it. Do you think that it is a better idea to choose somewhere a little cheaper but further away or get as close as you possibly can to the studio you're working at? Um, 
it uh when i started working here there was um a guy who had just started working here before me and he was living in orange county he commuted two hours to work and two hours from work what i will say is that it steals from your sleep time um and if you are the kind of person who can function without sleep um then good for you and you can live wherever you want but if you're not like me then um just take that into consideration when you're deciding where it is that you're going to live it is more affordable the further you get away from the city um parking is easier but like traffic is a pain it's so bad i i live in alhambra and during the pandemic it's taken me 20 minutes to get to work but when it's not a pandemic it takes me like an hour so just i would i would when you're here it, I would even I would even say like if you have an opportunity to like drive out to LA and just check out the area before you commit to renting an apartment or wherever it is that you you know you're considering living I would I would consider like taking a trip out here just to check it out. I did that when I was um when I was going to be moving to Arizona for school, I took a trip out to Arizona and um, and checked out the area, um, looked at different apartments before I moved, and it was really helpful for me to make a decision for myself because it's it's it, your decision can't be based upon you know what other people say or other people's experiences. You need to you need to make a decision based on what you're comfortable with and you know like i was gonna move into an apartment in koreatown and then i went and i looked at the area and i realized that i was the only woman in the area everyone that was walking around was like like a middle-aged man and i was just like i get off work at 3 a.m and I'm not about to be walking four blocks to my apartment in the middle of the night by myself in a neighborhood where it's all dudes. So, suss it out. Cool. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just talk and talk and talk. Yeah, I got one. Earlier, kind of when we first started, you were talking about your different roles as starting as like intern to runner, then to assistant. And it kind of sounded like, depending on the day, you could be any one of those roles. How does that work at East West? Is there like a defined, okay, you moved from this place to this place, or it's you're here at East West and you can fill whatever role we need you to fill? Um, yes and no to your question about there being definition between roles. Um, so, uh, one of the uh one of the reasons why my experience in every position makes me good at my job is because i know how to do every job and i do every job when it's necessary so if we're busy i i'm a booking manager i'm an assistant manager i manage the running staff you know like that's my primary responsibility aside from being at the front desk but like typically like that's not something that you would expect a manager to do like go clean the toilet or you know whatever it is but i do it when it needs to be done because there is no task that is above you know or below my pay grade um there's there's no task that i'm unwilling to do there's tasks that i don't want to do but i'm gonna do it if it needs to be done and that's expected of everyone on staff so um I can't tell you how many times we've had staff meetings and Candace has been like, look assistants, I know that you, that you have already done the runner thing and you're over it, but we need you to pick up the slack and we need you to, you know, do whatever it is that they wouldn't normally do because the runners need help or, um, or vice versa, you know, like, runners i know that you're tired i know that you're working long shifts you're busting your ass you're you're going on runs but we need your help in the rooms and we need you to help the assistants with 
fill in the blank, be it like a setup or a teardown, you know, um, it goes, it goes in every direction. So everyone on staff is expected to um, help each other. Um, as far as like the promotion process is concerned, like there being a defined line between each role that you play when you move up, um, it's not, it's a fuzzy line. Um, we have, <laughs> We have we 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 lovingly refer to um, some positions here as run assisting, which means that you're running and assisting sometimes in the same shift. So you're running, and then when you're needed in the room, you're in the room assisting. If you're in the room assisting and you're needed to go on a run, then you're going on a run. So um, it's definitely a very like gradual process in which you're sort of evolving into you know from an intern into an engineer um and there's not really any defined lines until you get to a point where you are an assistant and you're no longer scheduled to do runs you're no longer scheduled for running shifts there becomes there comes a point in time where that like sort of that wall comes down and you're no longer scheduled for those sorts of shifts. Um, that's, that's changed a little bit during the pandemic because we thankfully have been able to pay everyone on staff full-time wages, even though they're not all in the building working. So that means that people who are needed in the building are expected to be available if they are, um, you know, if their health isn't going to be compromised by doing, I mean, if they're not at risk, you know, like, uh, like my mom, for example, has lupus. If we had somebody on the staff that has lupus, we wouldn't expect them to be in the building working. We wouldn't expect them to put their lives at risk um, in that way. So if, if you um, are willing to be here and you're an assistant, right, like, up until we reopened, um, we had assistants scheduled at the front desk to do security shifts. So they would be the only person in the building. They would just be keeping an eye on the building, which is not necessarily something that we would have expected them to do when they were just assisting pre-pandemic. But now that we're in this situation, it's something that we expect of the whole staff. So, you know, obviously like we're a family, uh, everything is evolving and as things change we're pitching in in every possible way and it's expected of the staff to be willing to to perform any task um, but you're not you won't be um, you know and there is a, a, a line between being a runner and being an assistant hope that's hope that answered your question it wasn't too confusing yeah definitely thank you Hey, Sydney, I got to run. Uh, say hi to Candace for me, and uh, you take hey. care. Congratulations. It was nice to see you, Jeff. Yeah, yeah take care. Hello, Candace. You said hi. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah, I got one. Go for it. Uh, uh, so with all the you know, safety protocols in place, like it's only a certain amount of people in the studios now, uh, do you think with taking on interns, um, will that be like more restrictive? Like you're not going to be taking on as many now, or will you still try to kind of take them as they come? Um, that's a good question. We actually just brought on an intern. Um, he was uh, he was slated to start his internship this summer, and um, it was kind of put on hold. He came in for an interview, and then all of this took place and unfolded so um his internship was put on hold and then um he st he stayed in contact with candace he kept like reaching out to her like hey i'm available whenever you might need me and eventually candace um you know told him yeah we're reopening now so you know, we're obviously observing all these new protocols and ha we have these new procedures and you'll have to, you know, follow all of these new procedures and it's going to be a very unusual internship, but 
uh, why don't you come in and start your internship? And so he's been working now for like, I think maybe a week or so. Um, and it is very unusual and it's hard to know how, what an internship is supposed to look like during a pandemic. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if this internship process goes well, um, then I don't see why we wouldn't consider bringing on another intern further on down the line. I think that we want to limit the number of people that we have in the building right now. So we're not going to bring on like two or three interns at a time, but, um, you know, having another person around to help out has has been successful so far. So I guess we'll just see how this plays out. And then potentially, yes, in the future, I guess we might have more interns uh, during the pandemic. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, guess. it's um, it's been it's been kind of sad to see that um, this has obviously affected people's education and, you know, obviously many of you are invested in this education right now. And um, I hope that you all are getting the most out of, uh, out of this new, this new normal uh, while you're learning how to be engineers. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to bring on an intern if I didn't feel that they were going to have an opportunity to learn and to, you know, uh, to move forward with their career. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Sydney, I actually have another question for you. How do you feel like things are um, moving along in your market as far as other facilities maybe operating and um, is everybody just like trying to reopen slowly and they're just a little bit timid because we we've we've had some calls and you know we've been talking to some studios that are reopening slowly um but it there's definitely still a feeling of like holding back for sure yeah um, so what what do you see on your front um there you know i haven't communicated um with many uh like studio managers or people that work at other studios but from what i have heard um film studios are a little more reluctant right now um you know being that they operate with unions and so on and so forth it makes it a little more a little more difficult for them to establish what a what a film studio is looks like and how it's supposed to operate right now because as you know they have very stringent policies and procedures as it is um that's not fair boo to the film world <laughs> um and I'm in uh, film school so it's boo to that right now oh okay got you um so as far as music studios are concerned um i'm not going to name any studios specifically but I have heard of two studios shutting down because uh, their staff has been exposed to the virus. Um, and I, I will name specifically Shangri-La Studio because um, I uh, recently spoke with someone from their staff. Uh, they stopped by East West to pick up some tapes for a session, but um, uh, they said that they were booking, they were open, but that they had a very limited staff um, and uh, that they were just limiting their services. Uh, like they would ask that their clients bring in their own food. Um, they let them know that they weren't going to be going on any runs for them or picking up anything for them. So it's a very limited experience, but they're still able to come in and book the, the studios to record or mix or whatever it, it might be. Um, we don't have that limitation here. We're still providing our usual services to our clients, but I am um, uh, encouraging the alternative of delivery so that we are limiting our staff to exposure, you know, um, we're basically trying to limit exposure in every way possible, be that client or staff in relation to having to leave the building to 
you know, pick up anything for the clients or for the studio. Um, but yes, there are other studios that are opening. Um, I've heard that Candace has been sharing some of our new policies, procedures, and forms with other studios. So I think that we're all sort of like moving in the same direction, um, but our progress obviously lies in different places. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for answering that. Um, I mean, on a positive note, a lot of like the webinars that we've been joining with um, industry professionals, um, you know, they, even though it's kind of a, been on a downturn um, recently, like they're expecting the industry to really bounce back harder yeah. than before, especially studios, right? Where now all the creatives have been in quarantine and they've been working on new material. They can't go on tour. So what else are they going to do? They're going to go record an album. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah. Uh, we just did a we just did a live streaming event with um, Airborne Toxic event. You can uh, review that footage online. Um, but uh, the streaming was actually really great uh, for the first minute or so. They were having issues with um, with the stream, but uh, then throughout the rest of their concert, it was really impressive how 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 good the sound was and how great the the video looked, the visuals. Um, it was actually really entertaining. So um, we're hoping to do more more projects like that, more live streaming, more you know virtual concerts. Um, so hopefully, there's a new you know, like a, a new um, booking that emerges from all of this, um, aside from just recording an album or uh, mixing mixing a record, um, we're hoping to do more streaming. Yeah, uh, definitely see, seems like things are, that's going to be um, new kind of up and coming industry. Uh, do you guys actually utilize Dante? Dante, no. Um, is that something you I guys know that, considered? I don't think so. That's a Candace question, though. Um, I feel like I've heard a conversation about Dante here in the studio, but I don't think it's that it's part of our intent to use Dante. Uh, that is definitely a question that you would want to ask her personally, though. Yeah. Okay. Ask the boss lady. <laughs> Anybody else? You know, for such a small group, there were some really great questions today. Thanks for the, you know, the thorough cross examination. <laughs> oh, is the internship? I so yeah. appreciate you taking the time to do this. Just like I said, you just explain everything so well. And that's not everybody we've had a Zoom call with. So it's just, it's really appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I was I was there for David's uh, panel, or it's not really a panel; it's an interview. But I was there for David's, and I had a really hard time not like interjecting and giving my opinion about everything. And so I was just like, "Why don't I just do my own?" <laughs> and then I could just talk for an hour. It would be great. Um, I just saw this question: Is the internship available to international students not during the pandemic time? Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, who asked that question? Oh, hey, I see you now. Um, so we've had international, um, interns and they, it's, it's a little difficult because there's like, uh, a visa to consider there are obviously like legal restraints um and i don't know much about that that's more of like a a candace question but it has happened um part of the problem though is that um like i said when we bring on an intern we intend to hire so uh we've run into the issue of um, having an international intern and then hiring them and their visa running out and them not being able to stay here. Um, one of, uh, one of the, um, 
one of the runners that used to be on staff here was from Canada and he had an artist visa and he wasn't able to fill the requirements of that visa to be able to continue um, working here and living here. And so he ultimately had to move back to Canada. And I really miss him. You know, it's funny because I feel like our, yeah, Bray Bray, <laughs> I feel like our inner, it's, I shouldn't express any sort of favoritism but I felt like two of our most successful employees were international. Um, uh, Brayden, like you just said, Natalie, it was awesome. We had another intern and runner here. His name was Elon. He was from um, uh, Israel and I miss him a lot. He actually left because he, he wanted to focus on, um, you know, uh, building, building his portfolio portfolio to be able to renew his visa after a year um, so he didn't continue working here but I was so disappointed when he left because he was great so um, unfortunately there is that you know um, that uh, variable involved otherwise yes we we do and and we encourage you know international students to apply granted they are able to continue working here at the end of their internship. Do, 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 do. Cameron, did you have a question? Uh, I just want to say that I, well, first of all, hello. I don't think I've met you yet. Um, I'm one of the coordinators here. Um, okay. I just want to say that I appreciate you talking about the parking situation. Like we're coming up with an iBook for internship and okay. I wrote a whole chapter on parking. And like I told in my, in that, I was like, this will take on its own character in your life in LA. Yeah. It's going to be its own thing that's in that chapter of your life when you move out there. Yeah. So embrace it. And then I gave them examples of like, you know, parking on one street and not understanding that they may be their street sweeping on one side and then certain days. And then there's like, there's another sign, like literally on the same pole, it's like no parking between two and four. And then, yep. then there's another sign down the road that's like event parking only for today only. Like yep. I got a car towed hiking in Griffith Park because I didn't see, there was two like, you know, Cadillac Escalades parked uh, that I was parked in between. And I didn't yeah. see a special thing that said, you know, event parking by the Greek uh, theater. Oh, yeah. Or, or parking in West Hollywood where you have to have your wheels turned a certain way or you'll get ticketed. Yeah, there's a I just don't even go to West Hollywood. <laughs> I, I live in West Hollywood, yeah. Yeah. No, but, yeah, parking, does, it's like, it's like, uh, I feel like it's something that you should be able to put on your resume, like drive and park successfully in Los <laughs> Angeles Metro. I tell them uh, anywhere you live in LA, even if you live close-ish to the studio, plan for at least an hour of traffic and then also yeah. plan for parking on top of that. Which yes. Like another 30 especially, yep, especially when you're working somewhere like east west because there's no designated parking at the studio for staff you have to park on the street which means that when there's street sweeping on monday and tuesday from 10 a.m to 1 p.m there's no parking anywhere i remember being an intern and a runner and like parking at the meter on sunset because i couldn't find any parking anywhere else or walking several blocks to my car running to my car because i have to pick up this food right now but my car is half a mile away it's just like and then parking when you get to the place where you're picking up food it's really another year right it's a whole nother chapter of your life in Los Angeles. Cool, I like that idea, an iBook. Yeah, yeah, sort of like a, a local guide to LA. Yeah, I tried to give them like Valley Village, that's like one of the places, Alhambra, Pasadena. I gave them all different like, you know, suburbs, Culver City, yeah. places where it, there's gonna be parking. And that's why I put them like, if you live in the Valley, there's chances are you're gonna have parking. Yeah, you know, it's parking everywhere so in the valley, but then when you go into Hollywood and below or even near downtown LA, I yeah, put, you know, I put like MacArthur Park in downtown LA. Don't go there. Stay away yeah. from there. <laughs> I don't care if any, if it's cheaper or if it's up and coming. Yeah. It's just not a good place. I wish someone yeah. would tell me that. So that way, I don't know when I didn't have a car in LA and I had to take the bus and I accidentally like 
miss my stop and I ended up near there it was terrifying yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean so I kind of just try to put that in the book I'm like stay away from these neighborhoods and these neighborhoods are cool I wish yeah. someone could have done that for me so I'm glad that you like you're talking about that kind of stuff in this I remember <laughs> asking those questions and getting like not really helpful information like people would list off neighborhoods that were like okay to live in but one of those neighborhoods that was given to me was k-town and yeah. i went and looked at an apartment in k-town and like i said earlier i knew that i couldn't live there so right. yeah that's really cool i uh, it's it's in there but like if people tell me about it i'm like it's kind of sketchy but like some people really make it work yeah Will said that he lived there but then he also said he had like a cockroach crawl across his chest. And I'm like, oh my God. For that, some people are super, they can be, live kind of like that. I can't. <laughs> That's another thing. Be ready to become friends with the roaches if you move to LA. Yeah. They're everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go. You walk around in Hollywood and cockroaches sc sc scurry across the sidewalk. They're yeah. all over the place. I told them, like, be aware where your renting place is. You guys need to ask, like, do they have those kinds of problems? Do they have, like, bed bug problems? Like, think about that. Because some people are trying to cruise in on, a, on an Airbnb. I'm like, what happens if that Airbnb has bed bugs? And yeah. then they said to me, I was like, guess what? If you report that to try and get your money back, they'll give you your money back, but they won't allow you to book another Airbnb somewhere else. Oh, wow. So you could potentially know that. bringing that to another place. Yeah. But these are the oh, yeah, I suppose. I kind of try to, not to right. the, go back to the regular like, studio conversation, but I was just, I appreciate when you give them. Well, that's, yeah, them. that's part of, that's part right. of it. And um, I remember when I was getting ready to move uh, to East Hollywood, I found this awesome cheap apartment, but um, I, I went online to do some research about the address in the building and found reports of infestations and so um there's there's a i can't remember what it's called but if you google it you should find it there's a site that you can go to where it reports um uh uh different businesses and residences different addresses that have been reported as infested in los angeles and so um, I followed up on that information and found that like in past years, it had been a problem, but that that had changed in recent years. And so when I went in to sign the lease, I went to, I asked the leasing manager direct, directly. I was like, look, I'm gonna be straight up with you. I found this information and I know that this building has been infested in the past. Is this something that I need to worry about? And she, she was very honest with me. She said, yes, this is a problem that we've had in the past, but we have made massive changes. We have done uh, fumigation. We take um, pest control very seriously. If you see anything in your apartment, you're encouraged to report it. And we will fumigate every unit surrounding your apartment, including yours. And so it's just like a conversation that you have to expect to have with whatever, um, you know, property manager it is that you're dealing with in LA. And it's uh, I'm like roaches are just in LA. I saw a cockroach walking around the Chandler mall before the <laughs> COVID thing <laughs> hit. I mean, you yeah. just have to look into that when you're apartment searching and be yeah. honest with the people that you're renting from. For sure. Yeah. I do have a question. What's the, if you can talk about it, what's your favorite session that you've ever assisted on? Uh, and why? I'm going to say like top three, like, you know, name a few that you're like, this is really cool. I never thought I, I'd like be around this person and like, yeah, it's awesome. So, okay. Okay. So one of my favorite bands to work with is the Foo Fighters. And um, they did this, uh, well, it wasn't actually the Foo Fighters. It was just a Dave Grohl session. Um, but we did a session in Studio One where he, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen it. Have you seen Dave Grohl's play? No? You have, Garrett? 
that was filmed in studio one so basically um dave put together this like 21 minute rock symphony and it he was playing every instrument in the video and so uh that video that you see is not just him like miming to the music he was actually recording during all of those takes so we did overdubs he tracked the drums first and the drums uh it, there was three different kits so for each move i he didn't refer to it as a movement but i referred to it as each movement of the song there were three movements like three songs so each movement of the song was on a different kit so he would start on this one and then there would be sort of like this breakdown in between the two movements and he would play like toms between these two drum kits get on this drum kit and then after that movement he would move over to the third one and that was sort of like the the climax of the of the whole song and then it came to an end so he laid down the drums and then he went through and played every instrument but he insisted that all of the video be the original video in relation to the audio that was being used so the video crew was not allowed to sub in any video that did not directly correspond with the audio that was used which made it really difficult because every single time that he recorded he had to play it all the way through without any mistakes for every single instrument and um the video had to be good too so we were in there filming for like a week filming and recording and um but what was so fascinating about the whole thing was day like day one or I don't even, I, I think day one was set up, so probably like day two. But like day one of recording, when he laid down the drums, we obviously did like a couple takes, but Dave didn't play to a click, he just played. And so we did one take, and then we did the next take, and um, before we moved on, uh, the I think it was, uh, yeah, Daryl, Daryl Thorpe said, um, hang on a second, I just wanna I just wanna check something out. So he plays both the takes at the same time, and they were so close in timing that they started phasing each other out. He didn't play to a click. Do you understand what that means? That's very that difficult has... for a drummer. <laughs> That man has an internal metronome. It's super impressive. And so, um, I don't, I believe it. Like I've seen interviews where like Butch Vig was saying, he's like, he's never played to a click before. And we put him on one and he just, no problem. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. He's great. But, um, so, uh, that doing that video for a week was, um, a lot of fun. Um, I, uh, another session that I was on, that it's one it's one of my favorite memories um on a session here at east west uh i was working on i was the assistant engineer on a i still don't know how to say his last name and it's really embarrassing for me but it's a dan i'm gonna say dan mangan it might be mongan i don't know he's canadian but um we we uh did a record with him in studio two and um that was with daryl thorpe too how funny um we were in studio two with daryl thorpe and uh dan mangan uh and his band and we were tracking this record and um we were like it was very early on in the recording process in which um okay I'm trying to figure out how to tell this story. So we were in session and I was grabbing some stuff to take to the kitchen and I heard the control room door sort of creak open and then shut suddenly. And I was like, what's going on? Like, 
who was that? It's like peeking into the, maybe someone's lost. So I go out into the hall. I step out into the hall and I turn and it's Paul McCartney. And he's like about to walk out the back door to the parking lot. And I had met Paul before at this point. So I was just like, oh, hey, Paul, how are you? And he was like, I'm not going to try to reproduce his accent. But he was like, oh, hey, sorry. I was just, uh, you know, just being nosy. Or I don't remember exactly what he said, but I was just peeking in, just being nosy. And I was like, oh, no, it's cool. Um, and then uh, at that point, I think Daryl had realized that something was going on in the hall. So he opens the control room door and he steps out into the hall and he knew Paul too. He knew, he knows Paul McCartney. And so he steps out into the hall and he's like, oh, hey, Paul, how are you? You know, oh, well, maybe you don't know how Daryl is, but you know how Daryl is. He's just like, oh, hey, Paul. And so um, at that point, the band starts spilling out into the hall and we're all standing in the hall and these guys are like die hard Paul McCartney fans I mean they might be Beatles fans but they're like die hard Paul McCartney fans and so we're standing in the hall and um I think Daryl and Paul are talking about the fact that they're you know they're tracking a record cutting a record and blah 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 and then finally the conversation sort of falls flat and there's nothing being said and I can feel that Paul is about to walk outside and leave and I'm like well do you want to come in and listen <laughs> and I could just tell that all of the guys were just shitting bricks like oh my god Paul's gonna listen to our record and so he's like oh yeah sure so he comes into the control room and everyone's just kind of like you know sitting like you know it's <laughs> just like oh fuck and the record is not finished by any means. It's like a work in progress. And so uh, we're playing back what we've worked on so far and we finish and Paul's like, oh yeah, that's great. I love it. And so, um, you know, obviously everyone is elated and trying not to show it. And um, so the lead singer uh, goes on to tell Paul that, uh, how he named his son Jude after Hey Jude. And they have like this moment where like, he's obviously sharing something with Paul McCartney that he's always wanted to. It's very meaningful to him. Obviously he talks about the sound of Jude, the Jude and yeah. how, you know. <laughs> and so um, uh, that happens and Paul leaves. And um, I end up seeing Paul again later in the day, but uh, I'm at the front desk later and, um, well, not at the front desk, but I'm in the lobby and uh, Paul is, Paul, is, Paul walks out the front door to sunset and he's just standing out there. I think he's waiting for a car or something. That's how badass he is. He doesn't need any bodyguards. He just stands out on sunset waiting for cars. <laughs> and so he's standing outside and um uh Dan walks out into the lobby and uh I was like oh uh, Paul's outside and so he goes outside and um <laughs> and so we have this um we have this camera outside the front door where like you can you can see who's standing there's like a video monitor so you yeah. can see who's standing outside the front door and i can see paul and dan just like standing there having a moment and um they're just standing side by side having a conversation and so he you know he fulfilled that lifelong dream of wanting to uh of wanting to meet paul mccartney and tell him about uh his son and naming his son jude and yeah. um and Pretty just cool. so that you just so that you all are aware you don't take pictures of clients you don't take pictures of clients you don't post pictures of clients on social media you don't share pictures of clients so just be aware of that and make sure that that is not something that you ever do right. um 
but yeah, that that's one of my favorite stories is is working on that session with Dan. I love the record, and then you know that that special moment in which he got to meet Paul McCartney. That's pretty awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and thank you for reiterating not to take photos of clients oh, yes. and sharing oh, yeah. social media. I think I even got in trouble not even sharing up anything about a client, but just saying I ate Dave Grohl's brisket. And oh yeah, insinuating like, that he was there. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Candace was like, "Take it down." <laughs> yep. Yep. And and like I said, I had met Paul before. You know, like I was, you know, we had an established relationship, whatever. I also have photos with Dave Grohl. I have photos with other artists, but I don't share it on social media. I don't share it with other people. It's something that I keep to myself. So that's very important to know because you, you could compromise everything if you release any kind of footage or media regarding any clients working at your studio. They come here to feel safe. They come here to have a private, safe space, and we take that very seriously. Cool. All right. So, any of any final words from the the students and grads? Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. I encourage you all to reach out if you want to. Um, if you have any questions, I'll put my email in the in the chat here thank you that was going to be what i wanted to ask i'm like i don't know if i should ask that like if she wants to provide it great but <laughs> thank oh, there you it so is. Much. yeah that's my email so um you know reach out if you have any questions if there were any questions that you wanted to ask but didn't feel comfortable asking in front of the group uh whatever that might be i am available all right, Sydney. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I miss you guys. Tell everybody I say hello. Um, it was one of the best experiences of my life getting to work at East West. So thank you for all the opportunities that you gave me and everything you taught me. So thank you for being here and asking me to, to share with everyone. This was really fun and hope to be able to do it again in the future. All right. So all right. Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Take See care, you later. girl.